welcome you to our All Too Short sitting together. Now, we've got uh, some questions. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll launch out into our questions and uh, see what we can do to answer them from the Word of God. Shall we pray? Father God, we praise you and thank you. What a wonderful God we serve. What a God of truth and light. What a God of might and power. What a God of grace and glory. Father, would you now be our teacher? Help us to know what we ought to do, how to serve you faithfully, how to live our lives as we walk our way through this world, each day bringing us one day closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Teach us just now, Father, we do pray, and we thank you for your promise to hear and answer the prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, the writer, the viewer wants to know, I'd like to know why God punished adultery with stoning in the Old Testament and why not today? So he wants to know why, <coughs> excuse me, adultery is punished in the Old Testament and why not today? Well, <clears throat> let's walk our way through this. First of all, if we go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, we find that adultery is part of the Ten Commandments. Simply stated, you shall not commit adultery. I'm reading that from the New King James. As respects stoning, there were only three methods generally that were used for capital punishment back in ancient Israel. One was stoning, the second was fire, and the third, not mentioned that often, but it is mentioned, was um, being slain with the sword. Um, so you've only got three ways that capital punishment was executed upon, upon the people. So uh, perhaps a more insightful look at the question would ask, um, why was adultery punished with capital punishment uh, in the Old Testament and not today? I need to note that there were any number of infractions that uh, were punished by capital punishment. In other words, they, they, they resulted in the death of the person who uh, committed the offense. Striking your parents, um, interestingly enough, could be uh, uh, dealt with with capital punishment. Witchcraft and divination, capital punishment. Bestiality, capital punishment. Child sacrifice, capital punishment. Incest, capital punishment. Homosexuality, male in particular, capital punishment. Sabbath violation, capital punishment. Blaspheming the name of God, capital punishment. And uh, taking on priestly duties. In other words, performing the rites that were solely the purview of the priests, a non-priestly person doing those things, offering sacrifices, making sacrifices. Now, there are some times when God gave special permissions, but a person assuming that responsibility, that was a, a capital offense. And uh, as I said, blaspheming the name of God. So there were any number of offenses that were punishable with capital punishment, that is, the death of the offender. And of course, uh, breaking this particular commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, was one of them. Israel was under a theocracy. That is to say that they received their instructions directly from God through a system of priests and later on judges. Um, they asked and these individuals and of course uh, prophets also um, gave instruction from God to the people, they were under a theocracy, and those issues were settled directly from God. They began to step away from that direct communication with God with the installation of a king. They wanted a king. They wanted to have a king like all the other nations had kings. And so as they brought in a king, uh, the Lord warned them that uh, kings would do certain things, 
not sanctioned by the Lord. He would, he would start wars. He would do other kinds of things. Take your son, conscript your sons. A number of things would happen. But each time they added a layer of bureaucracy. And I, and I, I call uh, having a king a layer of bureaucracy because now the king is speaking for the people. You're not at getting your directions directly from priests. You're not getting your directions directly from prophets. You're not getting your directions directly from judges as the Lord gives instruction to these individuals. Now you've got priests and you've got other layers of individuals coming in. Um, uh, each time you, you add a layer, we move directly, you, we move away from being directly instructed by the Lord. The truth is government that is the idea of government, the idea of having a governing body, of having, of having people to uh, be represented and to carry out the will of the people, is a God-ordained thing. Government is ordained by God, though not each, in, each government in particular. There are some governments do, who, that do not have the blessing of the Lord. The idea of government is a God-breathed idea, but that doesn't mean every single government was put there or established by God. Uh, we see people like Hitler, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, uh, Stalin, Lenin, uh, the Khmer Rouge, Henry VIII. Uh, these individuals who obviously were not getting their directions from God uh, were not supported by God. They were there. Uh, certainly God allowed it, but they weren't supported by God. They were not encouraged by God, nor did they get their directions for, for rulership uh, by God. But the idea of government is a God-breathed idea. Having said that, as we move away uh, further and further from the Bible times and closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, many things that God does not approve of are established by, supported by, aided and abetted by governments or governmental individuals that are not working at the behest or under the tutelage or under the superintendency of God. So we've gotten to the point now where things like adultery, some of these things which are so biblically uh, looked down upon are actually encouraged and highlighted and uh, applauded in today's world. Um, they are still sinful. They are still breaking of the commandments. Uh, they will still land you in uh, the flames of hell if you do not repent of them. But the world takes a very positive view of some of these things that uh, the Bible frowns upon. Most people today uh, in the world of the worldly mindset don't look upon adultery as that big a deal. Um, certainly in in uh, the television world, the Hollywood world, you find people uh, married four or five, six, seven, eight, nine times. And I did a study just some time ago for a sermon. And uh, we looked at the top 10 reasons why people get divorced. Um, handling of money, lack of communication, uh, verbal and physical abuse. Uh, and the, the, the order all, you know, it, 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 it flips. But the one thing that is always number one is adultery. In every study that I've seen, the top reason for divorce is one or both of the partners being unfaithful. It is a command of God. We, we look at the commandments of God as a transcript of the character of God. We look at it as, as a, a window into the soul, the mind, the heart of God. Uh, the only thing that is a better Example of who God is, of course, is Jesus Christ. But when we look at the Ten Commandments, we see we get aspects of the character of God, certainly uh, of heavenly interface with uh, human creation. So this is part of the mindset, uh, the heart of God. Thou should not commit adultery. You are given a partner. You are called to be faithful to that partner. You are called to stand with that partner and stand by that partner and to walk away from that partner, even though in today's world, in today's mindset, it's not a big deal. In, in biblical parlance, it, it was a big deal. Punishable, punishable by capital, capital punishment, uh, which I said there were three, um, stoning, uh, fire, and of course, by the sword. So uh, 
we've come a long way from following the Lord and we are paying the price for our spiritual adultery even as we are for our physical adultery. I remember um, working uh, on uh, the, the television show Law and Order for many, many years. And uh, that was, of course, over 30 years ago. I, if, I think if I had the opportunity to do that now, I probably would pass the opportunity. But I, I did then, as an intern working on Law and Order, I remember studying television back at uh, NYU, back in the early days of television, a show called I Love Lucy. You recall that Ricky and Lucy slept in twin beds. They didn't even sleep in the same bed. Uh, that's how chaste we tried to be back in those days. So when they had the bedroom scenes, he was in one bed separated by a, a table with a lamp on it, and she was in another bed, and they would talk across. But we've come a long way from, from that, uh, uh, those halcyon days of, of trying to sanitize uh, sexual relationships. Now, adultery is, is very, very common on TV, very, very common in the, in the movies, very, very common uh, in our world. It's part of popular culture. We just don't look at it like we did then. Of course, God has no hands but ours. So when, when the question is asked, why did God punish it? Well, he used human beings to, to punish it. But the mindset of human beings has changed. Uh, we don't get our our, uh, our lessons from priests anymore. We don't go to the priests. Uh, when we, we want to uh, get information, we go to the talk show or we go to the psychiatrist or the psychologist or we ask a friend or we ask a lawyer or we ask an attorney or someone like that, but we don't go to the priest. So God does not have direct control through a system of priests and judges like he did then. Does God look at the sin like he did then? I believe so. The rules, the commandments have not changed, but we have changed. We don't go. Uh, sometimes the pastor is the last person we go to to get information on, on how to run our lives and how to do things. We go to professionals. We go to, to, to people who are, who are paid to do this, who are not always getting information from the Lord. So I don't believe God has changed in how he views adultery. The Ten Commandments have not changed. They are ten principles. They are ten promises. But we have changed, and how we listen or uh, lack of listening to the Lord has changed. So God does not have correct, direct control as he once did through a system of priests and judges. So a lot of things are happening in this world that I, are not pleasing to the Lord. But praise God, one day soon, this world is going to give way to a brand new world in which there shall be no more sin. God will take care of sin and sinners and will establish a kingdom that will be under his direct aegis and control, which shall live forever and sin, iniquity shall not rise a second time. That is God's promise for which we praise the Lord. So God has not changed. We have. And uh, sin is still sin. And adultery, though it is practiced by people in the millions, uh, is no less a sin. Uh, sin is not, is not uh, rated or ranked by how many people do it. It's not open to plebiscite. Even if the whole world sins, if one person stands up for the Lord, then the Lord stands with that one person. So adultery is very common. To tell the truth, it's very common. It is still the number one reason why people get divorced. But is it still shunned? Uh, looked down upon by God? I dare say it is. It is the breaking of a commandment and um, uh, you cannot go to heaven uh, breaking commandments. You cannot be right with God breaking commandments. You must keep the commandments. You must do uh, the will of God. We are made for good works, the Bible says, and uh, sin will always be sinned and uh, that's where we, we find ourselves. So I hope we, we've sort of taken a look at this. There were things that were answerable through capital punishment, and adultery was one of them. And I guess some people would say it should be today, though it is not, because we have changed, but God has not. Now, um, taking a lot of time on that one question, but it was a good question. And um, it can be asked of all of these, these questions. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, Again, a, a, a commandment and uh, striking one's parents, uh, talking to you, your parents that way was punishable by, by death. 
um, quickly. The Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of God. If this is the case, did Jesus not go directly into the most holy place when he ascended um, to the Father? Uh, I've got to do this very quickly because I've only got a few minutes um, to, to wrestle with this. No, Christ did not ascend directly into the holy place. Um, when you look at uh, this idea of the ministry of Christ, you must look at the ministry that took place on the Day of Atonement uh, in ancient Israel. I've got to give you some texts, and I don't have time to really explain them all, but let's look at Leviticus 23. Verses 27 and 28, we would look at Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 through 11, and Daniel, of course, chapter 8, 14. I'm going to read something very quick because my time is running out, but I would ask you to, to um, read those texts and we'll help you with your answer. Um, look at the Day of Atonement and see the parallels between the ancient sanctuary services and the, the uh, antitypical services and the typical services as explained in the Word of God. Um, I'm going to read you something written by O.R.L. Crozier. This is on the day after the Great Disappointment in 1844. After breakfast, I said to one of my brethren, let us go and see and encourage some of our brethren. We started, and while passing through a large field, I was stopped about midway through the field. Heaven seemed open to my view, and I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to this earth on the 10th day of the seventh month at the end of the 2300 days, he for the first time entered on that day into the second apartment of that sanctuary and that he had a work to perform in the most holy place before, the com before coming to earth. That he came to the marriage or in other words, to the Ancient of Days, to receive a kingdom, dominion, and glory, and that he must wait for his return from the wedding. And my mind was directed to the 10th chapter of Revelation, where I could see the vision had spoken and did not lie. Um, let me just read a little bit more. There followed a careful investigation of the scriptures that touched on this subject particularly those in Hebrews, by Hiram Edson and the two close associates, Dr. F. B. Hahn, a physician, and O. R. L. Crozier, a teacher. The result of this joint study was written up by Crozier and was published first in the issue of the Day Star, February 7, 1846. This was a more widely read Adventist journal published in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, let me skip down and um, the rather lengthy presentation, well supported by scripture, brought hope and courage to their hearts as it clearly showed that the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is in heaven and not on earth as they had believed earlier. Now, Ellen White in a statement written April 21, 1847, declared in, in endorsement of Crozier's article, on the sanctuary question. The Lord has showed me in vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary and that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. So what she is saying is that the understanding given to O.R.L. Crozier the day after the great disappointment, October 23, 1844, was indeed God showing his people and encouraging them post great disappointment that the sanctuary to be cleansed was not the earth, but that it was the heavenly sanctuary. At a latter time, she wrote of the rapid development of doctrinal understanding which followed this disappointment. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary, transpiring in heaven, and having, deci and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. This is manuscript 13, 1889. There are four or uh, five 
uh, points that I want to go over very quickly that will help you uh, in your wrestling with this idea. Because this has come up before. Um, some great theologians have thought that Christ went initially within the veil, that he went into the most holy place. But that is not sequitur with the activities on the Day of Atonement performed only by the high priest. Christ is, of course, our high priest. Remember, Heaven saw his great book, Christ Our High Priest, which discussed some of this. Um, those things happen on the Day of Atonement by the high priest. One, uh, remember in your discussion, in your studying, that these things happened one time, one time throughout the year. And of course, uh, historically, uh, typically, they'll happen one time, and that time is now. Two, these activities on the Day of Atonement were the purview of the high priest. They, uh, the, the principal actor was the high priest. They were the purview of the high priest. Number three, special preparation, special heart preparation, special soul preparation had to be made for that day of atonement. Just as special preparation, the receiving of the early and latter rain must be made prior to the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Revelation tells me uh, that when he comes, his reward is with him. And so those who are going to receive that reward will be determined before he comes. He that will, will be holy will be holy still. He that will be just will be just still. He that will be unholy will be unholy and unjust still. So special preparation must be made now, brothers and sisters, during these times that uh, probation lingers before the coming of our Lord. For the judgments of that day are irrevocable, non-negotiable, and final. In other words, when Christ comes, there will be no second chance. There will be no negotiation. There will be no change of heart or mind. The time to change one's heart, one's mind, one's direction, one's life is now. Christ is telling us now to get ready for his second coming. All heaven is astir. The Holy Spirit is working. The ministry of angels. Uh, the crisis interceding. Now is the accepted hour. Tomorrow, you don't have that promise. So we give our hearts to the Lord now because tomorrow may indeed be too late. And number five, sin was dealt with at the end of the day of atonement. If you are not right, if you had not afflicted your souls, if you are not part of of the kingdom, you were cast out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is how it's going to be when Christ comes again. You will either be in, or sadly, you will be out. You will be in God's kingdom, or you will be out. There will be no change of mind. There will be no change of heart. Christ is not coming to plead. Christ is coming to give his reward to those who have sealed their souls who have sealed their fate in him. Christ then is coming to make up his jewels, but those jewels will be decided before he comes. So I hope that, that um, uh, gives you uh, a little insight into this very, very important question of what happened in 1844 at the end of the 2300 days. Again, this is fun. The time goes so very, very fast. Hopefully we'll see you again next time. You keep writing, we'll keep answering. Together we'll learn from the Word of God. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.